devil's going to come and get me. He's hiding in the cave, you know. And the winds come, and he was scared, and the, and the lightning hit and scared, and, and storms came. And finally, in a still, small voice, God said, I'm with you. So Elijah immediately shouts out his worries. Oh, my God, there's not another believer anywhere. I'm the only believer there is. And God says, no, you're not. I have 5,000 more that you don't even know about. So what happens a lot of times is we see our own futility, our own end of our believing, and we forget to look at God. There are more with us than there are with the enemy. You have two to one against the enemy. The problem is our believing is not in ratio. We forget who we are. We forget what God made us. We forget, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to say, God, go to God. Let him help you understand who you are, what God has done, how he set you up, and then you'll become confident in who you are. You'll learn to trust God and not just believe God. You'll settle down and rest in peace. And people look at you and say, you're glowing. What is the key? The key is, is having a walk with God whereby he helps me when I can't help. He takes my worry, he takes my cares. Now listen, there's some of you sitting here like me and wondering why healing hasn't come. First of all, it has nothing to do with God. Healing is already set up. So if you're concerned about why you haven't got this and why you haven't got like that, don't mouth it. Don't speak that. In other words, you're going to be thinking that until God sorts it out and said, have you forgiven everybody? Is there somebody you haven't forgiven? We'll keep you from being healed. I'm mean, so, so there are some things that God might tell us. We make a small adjustment. Boom. So you go to God and you say, God, is there something? Not, not this. Is there something I'm doing wrong? No. God, I'm, I, there's something I must be missing. I, 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 there's something I, I'm doing because your healing's already done. Healing is there. It's like medicine. All I got to do is reach up and absorb it and get my healing. So why am I having that? Well, number one, have you forgiven everybody? Number two, are you talking about others? Making comments and things you maybe shouldn't say? You know? They're always doing that. They're always doing this. Be careful of that. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And again, I have to do these illustrations because a lot of times I want you to check. So I, I have a little thing I, I taught years and years ago. If you're going to get a home run, you have to touch every base. So you go, Lord, I hit the ball. I believed I received. This is what the word says, and yet I'm not seeing all of the manifestations yet. So, Lord, first base, have I forgiven everybody? Second base, am I speaking in agreement with your word? Third base, I'm getting ready to round home. Do I have enough praise and thanksgiving for something that's already been done? And then you hit home. Now, all I can say is that it isn't the fact that God is failing or God, now listen to me carefully because we have some young in here. God is not up there going... Carrie, I'll heal, but Charlotte, I won't. I'm using you, Charlotte. <laughs> no, God can't treat me, Terry, any better than he treats you. The key is, is our receiver bent or not? So we go to God and say, Lord, I need some help. I need you to make some adjustments on me. I need you to straighten up that part that, that falls short. And God says, no problem. Then I can rest. I can enter God. I can start praising God. Why? Because he's got it. I gave it to him. I, I gave the situation to him. He's got it. Are you still with me? So seek to be right with God. Seek the dominion of God in your life. And don't worry about tomorrow. See, I got that. So your old man, your fleshly man and woman, <coughs> is a worry wart. <coughs> Or at least can be, <laughs> right? We are to be full of life, not full of regrets. I asked my wife some time ago, I said, honey, do you have any regrets about our marriage? And she says, not one. I says, 
isn't that great? Boy, I, I didn't know how to answer that. I said, neither do I. Now, do, do problems exist? Yeah. Are things to be worked out? Yeah. But I have no regrets. Why? Because if I start regretting what God did, I'm opening myself up for attack. If God picked my wife out and picked me out for my wife, then I should be happy that God did it. Can you say amen? And for those of you that are single... I'll let you know, let God pick out your life partner, okay? And there you are. Don't worry about it, okay? Now, if you're married and you don't like what you're married into, guess what? You can't get a divorce. You have to work out with God all of your stuff. And the key is marriage will have trouble in it, Because of the flesh. That's what the Bible says. You're going to have some trouble in marriage because of your flesh. So get out of the flesh and ask God to help you. When you want to let somebody have it verbally, don't. When you see something that needs correction, I worked on that today, don't. Because people already know when they're doing it wrong. Most of the time, right? You know when you made a mistake and when you do something wrong. Right? You don't need a pastor to remind you. (laughs) Gary, you did it wrong. Let me rub your face in it a little bit. (laughs) How's that like? You know, you stepped in the dog (laughs) doo-doo. We all know. So basically, we're looking for answers, aren't we? We're looking for situations and things to apply whereby we can rise above the bigger elements of the bondages that are in the world because Satan is the fallen prince and he thinks he's the god of this world. Now, when we do what God expects of us in our daily routine, God favors us with what it takes to maintain joy and happiness and strength. I can't wait for tomorrow, even though today's not done. We got this afternoon. Well, people sometimes are living from paycheck to paycheck, incident from incident, and they don't have something positive to look forward to. Well, you do. Somebody said, well, what if somebody over there in North Korea hits the red button and blows everybody up? Graduation day. (laughs) And what if somebody, you know, tells us or turns us in or does this and everything like that and all of this and then blah, 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 blah. blah. Praise the Lord. See, it's not my worry. And it's not your worry. Hello? Hello? Well, what do you mean? Well, then why am I worrying? Because you're dwelling on it. You're mouthing and talking about it. And so it registers around us like a big cloud. Remember peanuts? Huh? Charlie Brown. What was the guy who had the cloud around him all the time? Pig pen. And a lot of Christians are like pig pen. They got so much negativity and so much junk that they're literally flagging the enemy and they're, you know, they're flopping around on the deck of the boat instead of you know, sitting being still. God doesn't want us to be worried. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 10. We have many concerns in life. There's natural concerns in life because life itself in this planet is flawed. Life from God is not. Jesus says when you find me, you shall have life and have it more abundantly, right? But that life comes from God. We're trying to get an abundant life here, but you're not going to get it here hungering for food and clothing and this and that, but seeking God first, he's going to lay it right out for you. When we first bought this place, it was about $3,500 a month. And I went to God, and uh, in the situation, we had a whole bunch of people move on to other churches, and all our finances went zip. So I'm looking to God, and I'm saying, how are we going to maintain five acres of building? What are we going to do? And God says, you're not. I am. I've got this. He says, will you do me a favor, Carrie? And I says, yes. And he says, keep your care of it over in my lap, not on your mind. As soon as I did that, I got joy. God started taking care of bills. 
started doing things, answers to prayer come flying in. And I said, Laurel, the thing I did is cast my care over on you. And he says, exactly. Let me worry at night while you're asleep. I'm up all night. I don't sleep. There's nothing that concerns me more. And I enjoy answering your problems. Folks, that's the truth. If that wasn't the case, Jesus would never have came to where we were. Father would have never sent his son because he loved us so much. If we were having problems and they were too much, he would have never seek to minister to us and bring us out of our problems. Can you say amen? And he has not stopped. Luke 10, please. Verse 38 through 42. Now it happened as they, w- they went that he entered a certain village... And a certain woman named Martha, everyone say Martha, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted. Underline that, please, if you're underlining your Bible. Martha was distracted. Folks, young Christians, it's easy to get distracted. And Martha was what? Distracted. Mary was doing what? She was listening at Jesus' feet. Martha was distracted by her much serving. So let's read this. It's kind of fun. Okay. Distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Nyah, 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 nyah. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? What's that sound like? Does that sound like spiritual? It's flesh. It's actually, folks, Martha isn't really sinning here. She's just falling privy to the dictations of her flesh and the need of her house to be straightened up because Jesus is there. Now, folks... If Jesus was coming to your house, wouldn't you be concerned about how it looked? Sure you would. Come on, let's be honest. Right? And so how would you deal with it? Okay, now let's look. This place is God's house. God dwells here. I'm just blessed enough, not only that he dwells here, but he dwells in our hearts. But think about it. We come here to meet with who? I'm here to meet with you. Key, I'm not here to watch the babies cry. Now, I'm not here to be noticed if I cook food or not. I'm not here for the praise of men. I'm here because I want to meet with God. Now, listen, a guy said to me, he says, well, a lot of people like to go to a church where there's everything is there for them. Church is big. There's lots of people. Ah, la, 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 la. And I hear that, and I says, yeah, those churches are wonderful. I don't have a problem with them because we all belong a part of that church. There's only one church in heaven, folks. I says, but our church is different, because when you come here, you have to focus on God and others, because we don't have a beautiful building. Hello? We don't have a lot of beautiful things and, and blush pews and all that. People who come here are coming here for who? That's right. And that's what we're all about. So naturally, we don't want people to distract. And there are people who go to a big church, and they'll sit there the whole part of their life and not get saved. Why? Because there's no opportunity for them to be interacted with to be saved. Okay, so he goes on further. Okay, Martha was distracted, and Jesus answered and said to her, now listen what he said, very important. Martha, Martha. You are worried and troubled about what? I say, it wasn't just the one thing. Martha was a friend. Here's something Mary got a hold of that Martha missed. And really, this is, now, catch me quick. This is really the story between Jews And those that seek God. Now, Jews seek God, 
But the religious Jews sought man and the praise of man. They stood in the street corners to be heard of men. They gave to be seen of men. They fasted to be seen of men. Religion will do that. Will try to impress others. But you're not religious. You have the Lord. Somebody says, man, you, you're just, I just see God shining in you. What, what's the credit? And you'll answer, Jesus. I've been fasting days and I've been seeking God. No, that's all brag. No, Jesus. Amen. You're getting it. So, so Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. He didn't say what you're doing was wrong, did he? Jesus didn't condemn her, did he? He says, one thing you need to do. You need to do this, Martha. Okay? But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part. See, her part was good, but Mary's part was better. Folks, you can have the prettiest toaster in the West, but if you don't know how to plug it in, all you have is a pretty toaster. Folks, we, when we come to church, we need to plug into God. Get our eyes off of mankind, plug into God, and get what God has for us today. This is the filling station. Hello? If you're out in the desert and there's only one filling station, and they only have one pump, you're going to wait. You're going to get that gas because you need that gas. In America... We don't have a lot of desperate people. We're very wealthy, very rich as a country, very prideful. You know the story, and we don't want to harp on that. But it's hard to get people's attention about the gospel because they don't hear the gospel preached the way it's supposed to be preached. <coughs> Jesus said about John the Baptist, he said, of all the prophets... <clears throat> Sorry. Of all the prophets in the Old Testament, there's none greater than John the Baptist. And everybody go, what? All the other, there's a, plenty of other good prophets. That are, none the greater. And then he says something really different. He says, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. What, what he's saying, I'll paraphrase it. Of all the prophets and all the teachers of old, John the Baptist was the best. He's the forerunner to Jesus. But the least in the kingdom of God, Carrie, is better than him because we're in the New Testament and not in the Old Testament. Hello. We have God living in us and not just working with us. See the difference? In the New Testament... If we asked God to come in, he came in. In the Old Testament, God couldn't come in. He could only enter into the project. If you were going to kill a bunch of Philistines, God! And you take the jawbone of a donkey and start slaughtering them all. Because you call them. And when little David, king, before he became king, saw fighting Goliath, the reason why he destroyed Goliath is he had God on his side. God working with him. But God wasn't in him. Well, Pastor Kerry, he was a man after God's own heart. That means he kept going to God. He kept going to God. But he still wasn't born again. How about us? Do we go to God every day? Or we try to wait out our own problems with our own self? And we have to work that out in our hearts so that we get God in there right away. Hello? You got to put oil in your engine or you're going to burn it up. All right, so anyway, enough illustrations on that. So Martha was caught up in serving while Mary was caught up in listening. The source of our power is in faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our faith comes by listening. Then because we love God and because we honor God, we serve. Never does our service come before our relationship with God. What do you mean by that? Because we don't serve to get. We love God and he, we serve. Do you see what that is? We, we serve because we want to, because God compels us to. 
But if I'm serving because I want God to notice me, God's not going to be impressed. Why? Because we're doing it in the flesh. We're doing it for selfish reasons. We want to please God and hope he's pleased in us. And you've forgotten the whole gospel. God said God loved you. God cared you. He sent his best gift for us. So you don't ask God if he loves you or not. That's kind of dumb. God, do you love me? You see what I mean? So we need to start taking up a confidence of who we are in Christ. Say amen, somebody. Go with me to Matthew again, 13. We're going to look at just one scripture there. This is the parable of the sower. But there's a warning in the parable of the sower, those that are hearing the word. It really is a, a message to people that come to church and hear the word. There's a message about worry and fear right there in the parable of the sower. Verse 22. Now he who had received... The word among thorns, or the seed among thorns, is he who hears the word, and the cares of this uh, life, okay, are the cares of this world, and the, uh, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and becomes unfruitful. Cares of this world, what is that? Worries. Folks, if you can... Try not to say to somebody, take care. <laughs> we mean well. Our language is really, and you're not blessing worries on somebody. We know that, you know. It's just like our conversations, because next week we're going to talk about the language of faith. But um, it's just, when, when you're talking faith, you don't say things like, that's just killing me. I'm dying if I do. I'm dying if I don't. You know, that just tickles me to death. Hello. Where do we get phrases like that? The enemy sows them in there. And when we talk about ourselves, I'm just a dummy. Wait a minute, God doesn't think you are. You might feel like you are, and you might act sometimes like one. But God does, God does not call you a dummy, and he doesn't want you calling his ownership, his property, a dummy. You belong to God. Right, your subconscious doesn't pick it up. In fact, when we teach on the mind, we're going to talk about the conscious, subconscious mind. We'll, that's in the future a little bit, but we got a lot of great stuff to share with you. <laughs> Amen. So, now he that receives seed or the word among thorns, here's the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, enter in and choke the word, becomes unfruitful. Cares are worries. So when you start to worry, it chokes the word. We don't want the word choked out in our life. Can you say amen? We want the word free and liberal and easy to get a hold of in our thinking. Why? Because the word of God is the power of God unto salvation. Now, let's go back to Matthew 6. Again, we're going to read a couple of the same verses. Remember what it says, no one can serve two masters. Do you see the contrast? I love what Paul says. I want to do good, but when I'm trying to do good, evil is present with me. What is he talking about? When I'm wanting to care for somebody, my mind's thinking, boy, I hate doing this. <laughs> <coughs> Pastor asks you to go out and give something to somebody and so you go out and do this, and you know, you're doing this, and you're thinking the whole time, they don't deserve it. While I'm doing good, evil is present with me in our thinking. When I want to do good, I find myself not being able to do it because I don't want to do it. Come on. Remember the parable where Jesus said there were two sons? And he said to the one son, go out and do this. And he said, I'll do it but then doesn't. And he says to the other son, do this. And he says, I'm not going to do it, but then decides that he's going to do it. Which one goes back to their house justified? Second one. He said he wasn't going to do it, but then did it. Okay? The first one says he was going to do it, but didn't do it. Now, do you know, do you hear it? did you hear it wrong the first time? It's the second one. Many times people will stubbornly say something out of the flesh and then their heart will convict them. 
they'll turn around and do it. But while we're doing good, evil is still present with us. Can you, uh, can you take off your body suit and hang it on a meat hook? No. So what you need to do is you need to go to God, let, let him quiet it down, let him salt your old slug, let your spirit and your soul arise, and step out of your prayer closet and your time with God in the spirit and not in the flesh. That means that when Piggy pulls out in front of you in the parking lot, you're not going to lose it. <laughs> Can you say amen? And finishing up with you. All right, what about this care? What about this worry? What if I catch myself allowing my, my flesh to really get into all of this kind of stuff? Remember verse 34, Matthew 6. It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. And Matthew 20, uh, 6, 24 says, you cannot serve two masters. In verse 25, I say to you, do not worry. Everyone say, I got it, Lord. Now, how many here know you need Jesus to help you with all that? Amen, amen. Wonderful. Now, go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. <coughs> We're going to look at verse 5 through 7. We're going to show you how in the church you can eradicate worry and you can be a blessed pew and servant of most high going to church. You know, there's a lot of people who go to church, but they cause troubles all the time because they want to be heard. We had a wonderful person one time come, and this person, bless their darling heart, loved the Lord, but have never been taught how to get out of carnality. And so they grew up into their car carnality. They could prophesy, they could do all this, but when they came to church, they wanted all the attention for themselves. Well, listen, I'm not sharing my pulpit with you when God anointed me to be here with you because you think you're all that. Mm -mm. God and all that thinking is resisted. Amen. So, well, who was that? Can I think about who that might? You don't even know this person. So stop thinking. Evil is present with me. <laughs> uh, have you learned to laugh at yourself yet? Huh? I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. Have you learned to laugh at yourself yet? I, I'm talking to all of everybody. I have to laugh at myself. My goodness. You know, and when I do goofy things, I'll just say, boy, that was a goofy thing. Now leave it at that and then laugh instead of getting all down and everything. All right, First Peter chapter 5, look at verse 5 through 7. Likewise, likewise, you younger people, submit or come in line with yourselves with your elders. Yes, all of you be subjective one to another and be clothed with humility. Everyone say Amen. Okay, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Verse 6 says, therefore, because he resists the proud, gives grace to the humble, therefore, humble yourselves. See, it's your job to humble yourself. It's God's job to lift you up. Now, if you lift yourself up, God will do what? He will humble you. He'll embarrass you to no end. Because you're exalting yourself, you see. And God doesn't want you to exalt yourself into a danger zone where the enemy can pick on you. He wants you to stay humble where he can cover you and he can clothe you and he can bless you. Somebody says, man, I love what you're doing. And you, you, you smile at him and you go, it's only because of God. If you say this, well, it's because I've been saved for years and years and years. I study my Bible, and I pray and, and stuff, and that's how I got all this. Pride. Okay? And, folks, we all have a thread of pride that sneaks up on us once in a while. Ask God to reveal it to you, and, and him and you catch it before others look at you and pity you. I want to be a macho man. <laughs> macho means idiot. Did you know? <laughs> macho meo means idiot fool. You know, I, for example, you want to listen to another word we don't realize? We're, we're, we're creatures of, 
I could care less until it's too heavy on me. The word Avon. How many heard of Avon? Nothing against Avon products. The word Avon means sin. It's the word for sin or iniquity. I'm just smearing Avon on my life. <laughs> so <coughs> if you want to laugh, you can laugh about that stuff. Yes, Avon's a good product, believe me, you know. But we're funny about things like that, you know. And so we need to be a little sharper, you know. The tool needs to be in the drawer. We need to have the last float on the parade. Can you say amen? Elevator needs to reach the top. Amen. We don't need to be a brick shy of a full load. Can you say amen? God makes up for those things. All right, let's go on. Okay. He says, for else, okay, this is really cool. Be submissive one to another and clothe the humility, for God resists the proud. Now, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Casting all of your care over on the Lord. Casting all of your care. Okay, take a look. At, this is not a good example, but it, it is an example. Here's my glasses, right? Everyone say, yeah? yeah. Come on, respond. I mean, I, I think I'm talking to the walking dead. Okay? <laughs> Seriously. The Christians... I can sit there in the pew, and they're completely asleep. You know, come on. All right, let's pretend, let's pretend this is our care. And I can either wear my care or cast my care. Which does the Bible say to do? Cast. So when you cast your care, that means you fling it over on the Lord. Actually, it means to fling it over on the Lord. Guess what? I'm going to have to really chase after that after casting it all the way over there, to get my glasses to wear again. But thank God I don't need to wear them. Because God somehow t touched me, and I, 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 they actually look worse when I'm wearing them. <laughs> Not look worse, but see worse. So I cast my care over there. I want you to get this. If you cast it over there, don't pick it up again. Just because you have a thought that comes back in your, your head, once you cast that worry or that care over on the Lord, you've let go of it. It's over on the Lord, okay? Don't, the enemy is going to say, is it really gone? And then you're going to walk over there in your thinking and pick it back up. Don't do that. What should I do, Pastor Kerry? Instead, say, I cast that thought down in Jesus. I cast that thought down in Jesus' name. As soon as you do that, a new thought will come right in there. Let me use an experiment. How many here have a dog? Okay, well, uh, this is what we're going to get to. Now, there are all kinds of dogs, so I'm going to use a, a simple illustration. Now, if I close your eyes, if I say black dog, you're going to get a couple of them. You're going to see a black poodle, you're going to see a Labrador, you're going to see other black dogs that you either experienced or saw. But if I say a Labrador black dog, you're going to see the picture, right? Very, very, very important. You see in pictures, okay? You understand in pictures. Somebody's tried to say, me, say to me, I don't see in pictures. What are you looking at right here? Carrie, that's a picture! You see, well, people all try to... No, God knows and understands you see. But so you need to see a picture of God answering your prayer of God handling your worry. And then it's sitting over there somewhere, and you're not going to pick it up again. Can you see that? So when all of a sudden you come, and, and you're a day late on your bill, and you can't do anything about it because it has to come in the mail, what are you going to do? You're going to learn to cast the care over on the Lord because you can't make the mail come any faster. Instead, you're going to start praising the Lord and the cares over on God and he's going to hit that mailman and he's going to make him lickety split. Why? Because his child is loving God. His child is getting caught up in God. His child's not worrying. His child's trusting. And man, I'm going to move heaven and earth on behalf of that child. That's you. 
You're not going to wait till the mailman shows up and then go yell at him. <laughs> all right, so here we go. So casting all of your care over on him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking the worriers. Because when we start to operate in the flesh, we produce, now listen to me carefully, and then I'm going to finish with you. We produce a scent. Now, I don't know if you've ever smelled somebody who hadn't taken a bath for three or four days. They can't smell themselves, but they, others certainly can. Well, you, you, you know that you don't want to stink, right? But in the flesh, when we begin to worry, when we begin to anger, when we begin to operate with that fleshly person, it produces a stench that tips the devil off that you're not in the spirit, but you're in the flesh. Jesus' silhouette kind of takes the back front, your flesh takes the forefront, and the devil looks at you and says, well, that's not Jesus anymore, well, that's Carrie. Certainly, he's picked up his worries. Let's check it. How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to pay your bills? It's like a little spooks on your shoulder. It says, I'm not. You're not? No, God has to pay my bills. I'm just working hard. I'm just loving the Lord. He has to pay him. Now, we have, to <coughs> we have to do what's expected for us. We have to do what God requests of us. But the worrying part, that's his job. Can you say amen? amen. All right, I think you got this. Now, folks, here's the problem. Be anxious for nothing. The moment you start getting anxious, pray. What is going to happen? What should you do the moment you get anxious? Cast your cares upon the Lord. Pray. Cast your cares on the Lord and pray. Right? You start to feel a little anxious, what are you going to do? Cast the cares on the Lord and pray. Because when you pray with the cares on your mind, you're going to pray your cares. Then you're going to come into that scripture that says God already knows what you have need of. And here we are praying what's on our mind instead of what's in our heart. We're praying our worries and our cares. We say, Lord, you got to go through it. God's saying, would you just believe my word? <laughs> instead, Lord, I know I could worry about this. I know I could be concerned about this. But Lord, it's just going to keep me up at night and it's not going to add one statue to my life. So it's yours. I cast the care of it over on you. And Lord, I'm going to enjoy your presence. You'll sense the anointing come down, a lifting come up, and you'll sense, boy, all of a sudden it's off your mind. Wouldn't you think that that's a better place to be than worrying and fretting all the time? Now, I, ex I explain to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit to show you exactly what I gave you today, and that is how to cure your, you from worrying. So you should know that there's a cure for worry and that God's going to help you with it and that you can overcome. How many of you believe that? Give the Lord a hand clap if you believe it.